May 23rd, 26th, sorry. And we are broadcasting live from Duke Spine Institute, Surgery Center Vieira. I'm Dr. Ari Dugmajan, assisted by my partner, Dr. Bada Patel. And we're gonna be doing a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion. Our patient has had a prior ACDF, I think at least one. And there are some segments that are fused, but they're still narrowing and there's adjacent segment disease at C3-4. So he's got a bad disc at C3-4 with stenosis. Spinal cord nerves are being pinched. He's also got instability at the base of the spine and he's having horrible pain. So we're gonna do a standard C3 to T2 decompression infusion. The T1 and T2 I don't decompress because there's no stenosis there. Uh, we're gonna explore the fusion as well from the back to see if bones are fused. The fusion he had before was through the front. We don't know unless we actually check to make sure there's no movement that the fusion actually took. To me, it looks like it's fused on the MRI, but you can never tell for sure until you get in there. All right, our incision is in the back of the neck. We're gonna start at the top here at about C3 incision. We're going through the skin and subcutaneous tissues. See what I do, Dr. Patel? I spread it and move the blade at the same time. Now we don't know for sure, are we at, how's our blood pressure? We don't know which levels we're at yet because we can't see the spine. It's impossible to see. Do you have the blood pressure good? That's perfect. All right, so I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna stay below the, the dermis and I'm gonna, right where the bleeders are. Did you, you inject it with epi, right? Sorry? All right, so in the very beginning, we need good muscle relaxation, which you had last time, doctor. Yes, sir. Um, and then I don't, uh, after that, we can start, once we get all the retractors in, we can start bringing the muscles function back. Okay. Okay. So these are Wheatlander retractors. And I don't know if I'll be able to get it in yet at the top, I guess a little bit. All right. What I'm using is a bovie or hot knife. It sends electricity through the body to a grounding pad located on the patient's thigh. And that electricity actually coagulates or cooks. We don't like you to use the word cook because it doesn't seem right in a human being but that's truly what's happening is the, the tissues are being seared. And by searing them, we're basically stopping any bleeding that would otherwise be happening as we cut through the tissue. Because all of the tissues in your body have a blood supply except for a couple. The cornea or lens, actually the lens is one of them and the, uh, the spinal disc, the inside of the spinal disc is another one. Can you think of any other, Dr. Patel? I think those are the two main ones. So those tissues get the meniscus in the knee. Okay, I didn't know that, but Dr. Patel informs me that meniscus in the knee doesn't get a blood supply either. So I guess there's three tissues, right? That don't get blood flow, but everything else does, even this tissue back here. So as we're cutting through to, sh to get exposure of the spine, we're going to have bleeding and if you don't do anything about it, the patient will bleed to death. And one of the things that's allowed modern surgeries to occur is the fact that we're able to control the bleeding and keep the patients from bleeding to death. Otherwise, there's no point in doing surgery because you're just gonna end up, you know, taking away one problem but giving the patient a whole new problem. So hemostasis or control of bleeding is a very important component of being able to do our surgeries successfully. And some surgeons are less successful and they end up having to transfuse their patients with blood from somebody else or pre-allocated pre, uh, blood from that patient. But at um, Duke Spine Institute, we don't do any blood transfusions. We don't need to. We keep our bleeding low by controlling the blood pressure and 
by using good hemostatic technique during surgery by using things like the bovi, okay? And the bipolar, which you'll see later. And then of course, gel foam and thrombin. And then bone wax, should it be needed. So what I'm feeling for are the spinous processes. To do this surgery successfully, we have to come down right in the middle on top of the spinous process. So we've got too much muscle contraction. I can feel the spinous processes, they're deep. This patient has a very muscular neck. Now notice here there's muscle, right? When I hit it, it contracts with electricity. That's how muscles work. But just to the medial point, point of it or midline, moving towards Dr. Patel's side, there is no muscle, it's just fascia. So you wanna stay out of the muscle when you're doing this surgery. You wanna stay just between the two muscles. And when I give it a little bit of bovi, which is electricity, basically, you can see the muscles jumping. This is probably C7 here, the T1, spinous process. It's very prominent. You want to feel that, Dr. Patel? So that's probably either C7 or T1, which means we're pretty close down here. I can use the cut mode on the bovi to cut through the uh, epidermis and dermis. That's the top button. It's called cut. The coag mode, you don't want to ever put it on the skin because you'll create a scar there and it won't heal properly. So you avoid the coag mode anywhere near the skin. You use it deep to the skin. All right, so we're, I'm gonna tell you that this surgery you're watching uh, is a posterior cervical. It's basically surgery on someone's neck. And what we're treating is a herniated disc causing narrowing, pinching nerves, along with um, instability or pain that's severe in this patient. We've been treating this patient with other methods that haven't worked. And they've had several prior fusions, not done by me. I don't believe I did his original fusion, someone else did. And from what I can tell, the fusions look pretty good on the MRI, but MRIs are not that good at telling if prior surgery was done properly. Being in here, I can actually get some information that will tell me by actually checking the bones and seeing if they wobble and move inappropriately, okay? All right, I feel the posterior elements, the spinous processes this is what I wanna feel. Let me see a cob. So we've done our beginning of our exposure. The exposure is where we, as surgeons, kind of show the part of the body we have to fix, which in this case is the cervical spine, as I mentioned earlier. And we're going through the back because this patient needs a long segment fusion. He needs multiple levels fused at above and below his prior surgery infusions. And so it's not something we can do through the front very easily. It's very difficult to do through the front. And he's had prior surgery in the front, so there's a lot of scar tissue up there. And if I go through the front, there's a very good chance that we're gonna hurt something while we're in there. Can you all see this, what I'm doing here, Sean? Yes, we can. All right, so I'm actually peeling the, the muscle. This is the muscle right here. I'm peeling it off the spinous process, but not damaging the muscle. If you actually pull on the muscle gently, you see little fibers right there attaching the muscle to the, to the uh, periosteum on the bone. Those are called Sharpie fibers. And that's what I'm cutting through is the Sharpie fiber. So I'm not actually damaging the muscle. I'm cutting the attachment of the muscle to the spine. Sharpie fibers. Now, he's never gonna miss his Sharpie fibers. And by doing that, I'm preserving the muscle function. I'm not hurting the muscle. When you start hurting the muscle, you start getting scar tissue and excessive pain. Still have a little too much contraction. I'd say a little bit more of the muscle relaxer, if we can. Now I like to bend my bovi tip, all right? Bend it in towards the spinous process and lamina I'm working on. In this case, the spinous process and lamina I'm working on is on my side. So I'm gonna bend it away from me towards Dr. Patel, who's holding the suckers. Once again, we wanna, if we identify bleeding, we wanna stop it immediately. And there's always gonna be bleeding in the back of the cervical spine between the two spinous processes, okay? 
That's where blood vessels move between from one side to the other. We call them collateral circulation. Think of collateral circulation as being blood flow that is to one area that can actually potentially go help another area when it loses its blood flow. The way to think about it is if you have a, a grass lawn and you have sprinkler heads, right? Well, your sprinkler heads, each head sprays water into a specific zone of the grass. If one of those sprinkler heads gets clogged, you really want the other sprinkler heads to be feeding water to the grass as well. So you have some overlapping in uh, the distribution of water from your sprinkler system. That overlapping you can think of as collateral circulation of blood. So if you take a blood vessel on one side, it can actually be fed by the other side of the blood vessels in the body. That's collateral circulation. And not just the other side, but other blood vessels around. All right, so I'm feeling for the spinous processes. It's a bit of an unusual spinous process here. Now he's not had surgery on the back of his neck before. So this is a bit of, of an unusual finding either an extremely short spinous process or it was injured in trauma. And this is right around C7, T1. A lot of scar tissue here too, which indicates trauma or inflammation from the past. So this, I don't remember his history if he had a motor vehicle accident or a slip and fall, but this is definitely not normal. There's been some injury to the posterior elements here. See that? So, it's not uncommon for people to have injuries to their posterior elements. Let's see where it's bleeding from. Mm -hmm. The other thing about getting into muscle, folks, is it bleeds. And it can bleed a lot. Nice job, Dr. Patel. We're not in the muscle right there, but man, there is definitely something abnormal here about his posterior elements. We'll have a better idea once we open things up, but it looks like he's had almost like an avulsion injury of a supraspinous ligament. Suck here. He has an extremely short spinous process and there's a lot of blood vessels in this area, more than normal, which tells me that there's been extra blood flow here at some point. And that extra blood flow could be related to trauma, most likely, since there's no tumor. There's no like uh, tumor here that I can see. So the kind of things that bring extra blood flow are tumors, because they, they grow so fast they need more blood. They call for more blood to the body and the body provides it, unfortunately. The other thing that, that creates more need for blood flow is inflammation. Far more common than tumors is inflammation. And this patient definitely has inflammation. That's suck please. That's kind of the crux of his problem. He has an inflammatory condition called osteoarthritis. You see the muscle here, right? Normally the muscle belly comes up to the top of the spinous process. So there should be a spinous process here, but his are way down here. There's something very unusual about it and I don't know if it's a congenital anomaly that he's born with or if it's a result of trauma. I mean, it's not a post-operative thing because he hasn't had surgery on the back of his neck before. He only had it on the front. So it can't be related to surgery. Luis, what you doing over there? 
You having a little party over there? A little uh, post, huh? Memorial Day. post Memorial Day party? Oh, come on. Isn't that amazing, though? It, look at this muscle here, and has it's all it's got scar. I mean, this surface here is not normal. That's uh, very white, indicating scar tissue from inflammation. So something weird has happened um, in the past. And what's most unusual is that there's no spinous process that's attached to. All right, so take this for a second. So C2 is going to be right here. I feel C2. Feel it. It's huge. Feel how big it is? It's like C7 almost. It's massive. And all the other cervical spinous processes, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, T1. I mean, C 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 7 is big too, but 3, 4, 5, 6 are small. So you got a big one at the top, C2. You got a big one at the bottom, C7. Everything in between is short. So that's how you know where you are. You can actually feel the spinous process of C2. I want to open this just a little bit more. So as you can see my marking, that was the end of my incision that I marked out, kind of where I was guesstimating C2 would be. And I need to go about five millimeters further. It's not much. And I could probably do the surgery without doing it. But the fact of the matter is if I do, don't do the extra five millimeters, then I'm going to struggle. And when a surgeon struggles during surgery, it's like struggling while you're swimming in a lake or the ocean. You don't want to be struggling. Struggling increases the likelihood of a complication. So surgeons that struggle, because they didn't do the exposure properly, in my opinion, really only have themselves to blame. But by struggling, you're putting your patient's health and safety at risk. For what? To save a, a second or two or a minute? It's not worth it. Always do what's right and best for your patient, especially when it comes to the exposure. Take your time, get it right. If you get the exposure right and you do it perfect at the beginning of surgery, then it makes the rest of the surgery go so much easier, safer. Not easier for you, the surgeon. Yes, easier for the surgeon, but that's not the primary goal. Primary goal is to keep it safe and for the patient to have a great outcome. A lot of surgeons don't think that way. They think, okay, I'm going to make it take shortcuts, shave time off the surgery so I can go you know, play golf, go play tennis at the club, whatever they're doing, maybe go see patients. Who knows? But I see it all the time. Surgeons taking shortcuts. It's not a good idea. Take your time. Do it right. If you do it right, I promise you, it'll, it'll be worth it in the end for everybody, including the patient. Most importantly, the patient. All right. Suck, please. So what you're seeing here is I'm literally peeling the muscles right off of the spine. And the spine is what's left, what you're seeing down there, OK? That's the spine. That's the spine. So I'm going to do one side, then the other. Right now, it's time to move to the other side. OK? You don't want to go too deep on one side when you still have the other side to do. This is symmetric surgery. You're doing both sides equally. So you want to do your exposure somewhat equally as well. I've gone as far as I can go on my side without doing the other side. Exposure. So here we go. I'll bend my bowie towards me this time slightly. It's about 5 degrees, 10 degrees. I'm going to retract the tissue off the spinous process. And remember, this tissue is important because this is what we're going to sew back together, both sides together at the end of surgery. That's your closure. That's your barrier to infection, your barrier to bleeding. That's the most important barrier at the end of surgery. It takes the tension off the skin edges. So it has a multifunction, and those functions are essential to having a good outcome for surgery. So what you do right here with the exposure 
is going to determine how your patient heals. And if you muck it up by, by not caring and not being careful, then your patient's not going to heal properly. All it takes is one thing to be done wrong, and then you get a complication like an infection or bleeding or a hematoma that would cause spinal cord injury, and then your patient is paralyzed as a result. So you don't want that. You want to make sure you, you do it right. This is, after all, neurosurgery. This is not um, assembling, you know, lawn furniture, even though that's important too, right? Because if the lawn furniture isn't assembled properly and the person falls off the lawn chair, then they're going to be here in the operating room. So prevention. It's really all about preventing injuries, preventing problems, health problems. So that's what I'm trying to do with this exposure. I'm doing it right so that I can prevent a complication later on. A lot of surgeons, I hate to say it, they don't take the exposure very seriously. They don't understand philosophically how important it is. Believe it or not, surgeons, a lot of surgeons these days have the attitude that complications are okay. I mean, they, they are certainly part of the norm. And they take the attitude that it's okay to have complications. Everybody has them. Every surgeon has complications, but that's not the truth. I mean, the frequency of complications is not the same among surgeons. So the reason it's not the same is has everything to do with the technique of the surgeon and the equipment available to the surgeon and the assistance available to the surgeon, like Dr. Patel assisting me, for example. That's preventing complications. By having an experienced assistant in the operating room helping you as, a, as an assistant surgeon, it makes all the difference in the world to prevent complications. If I didn't have a competent assistant, then I would be having more bleeding, I couldn't see what I'm doing, then I accidentally bovie the spinal cord, or I lose more blood than I should, and the patient needs a transfusion, they're anemic, they don't heal properly, they get a wound infection. The list goes on and on. The point is, is every little detail in surgery matters, okay? And a lot of, you know, a lot of surgeons unfortunately believe it's okay to have complications. They will never tell their patients that, but that's exactly what they believe. That's their attitude, okay? And I think that's the wrong attitude. I think surgeons should do everything within their power to minimize or reduce the risk of complication. Think about that. Is it in the surgeon's power to avoid complications? Yes, many complications can be avoided if the right precautions are taken, okay? Let's take bleeding, for example. Most surgeons lose 500 cc's to 1,000 cc's with this surgery, posterior cervical laminectomy infusion, multi-level. So that's 500 milliliters. I typically lose 50. Most surgeons lose 500. So that's 10 times more than me. Now, why is that? That's because I take precautions with blood pressure. I have my anesthesiologist control it, keep it where I, at the safe level where you don't bleed. All right, and look at how I do the technique. I use a bovi. I use a guarded bovi of all things. This is the most expensive bovi money can buy, but you're paying for quality in the bovi, okay? And by doing that, it, it distributes the charge just to the tip of the bovi. A lot of surgeons don't understand that. They don't think about it. They don't care about it. But if you have an unguarded bovi, the entire shaft is all unprotected, so the charge gets diffused or distributed along the shaft, not at the tip where you want it. That extra money you pay for a guarded bovi tip is worth it because it stops the bleeding faster. Look how fast that bleeding just stopped there. You see that? If I didn't have a guarded bovi tip, that thing would still be bleeding. So every little detail in the surgery has an effect on the outcome of the patient. And surgeons typically don't think about a lot of the details that they should be thinking about. That's what makes Duke Spine Institute different. 
We've worked through every little detail of surgery, which is why our patients are able to go home the same day of their surgeries. Like this patient will go home today. We have a question. Sure. We have a viewer asking, can a person who has had C2 surgery, a fusion, still be able to turn their head or will their neck movement be limited? Will a person who's had C2 fusion still be able to turn their head or will their neck movement be affected? So it's a good question, but I don't have enough information. What I'm missing is, what are you fusing C2 to? Are you fusing it to C3 or are you fusing it to C1? Is it a C1-2 fusion or is it a C2-3 fusion? It makes a big difference. If you're fusing C1 and C2, you're losing 50% of your neck rotation. 50% gets lost with a C1, C2 fusion. Now, some people don't have much movement there anyway because they have bad arthritis at C1, C2. In which case, you won't lose any movement. But if you have a normal spine with normal movement and you fuse C1 to C2, you are gonna lose 50% of the rotation of your head. That's because 50% of the head rotation happens at C1 and C2. The rest happens in what's called the subaxial spine, which is below C2. If you're fusing C2, C3, you're not gonna miss any of that movement. It's so minuscule. You'll miss thir three degrees of movement, of rotation. Three degrees is a lot less than 50, 50%, right? So I hope that answers your question. Suck, please. Uh-huh. Nice. This patient's not having a C2, 3 fusion, in case you were wondering. This patient's having a C3 to below fusion, which is very different. So what I'm seeing here is a lot of arthritis, and I'm also seeing that there was some kind of an injury um, to the spine in the past, significant injury, has caused the disruption of the supraspinous ligament and interspinous ligaments between, it looks like at least from what I can tell, C4, 5, and 6, and maybe 7. So it's probably a traumatic injury in the past, like a whiplash or a fall or a car accident that tore those ligaments. And this poor patient has had instability as a result with multiple fusions over the years. So hopefully this will be the last one he gets for his neck, the last surgery. There will be nothing else really to fuse. We have another question. Sure. One of our viewers is wondering, can you still have a chiropractor adjust your neck after spinal fusion? Can you still have a chiropractor adjust your neck after spine fusion? Um, the answer is yes, but it has to be done very carefully, and then the fusion has to be signed off on that it's done and it's already fused. Dr. Patel, you want to add anything to that? Would you agree or disagree? Dr. Patel says avoid the chiropractic manipulation after a fusion. But are you talking about cracking the neck, he's asking, or... Um, are you talking about like manipulation, you know, gentle manipulation? I guess it depends on the technique the chiropractor is using. So I guess what Dr. Patel and I are saying may be the same thing. If you have a chiropractor who knows what they're doing and knows what to avoid certain movements, then yes, you can go to the chiropractor. But if your chiropractor doesn't know specifically what to avoid in terms of movements, then don't go because it's more dangerous for you. I was basing my answer on the assumption the chiropractor knows what they're doing um, and knows what, what movements to avoid because they can damage your joints below and above your fusion, may even be able to uh, affect your fusion as well if it hasn't taken yet. Fusions take about three to six months to fully heal and become solid, minimum three to six months, sometimes longer. All right, we're ready for the deep retractors. Let's go with the cerebellar. Thank you. So my answer of yes, it's okay to go to chiropractor is based on assuming the chiropractor knows what they're doing and knows what to avoid certain movements. 
and tr treatment techniques, whereas Dr. Patel says just kind of a blanket, just better to avoid, just to avoid having a complication, assuming most chiropractors don't know what they're doing, which is true. Most chiropractors actually don't know what, thing, what things to avoid in our experience. Of course, you may have a different experience. Bipolar? We use chiropractors all the time. We refer our patients to chiropractors all the time. We think chiropractors are very important. Let him do it. What I'm bipolaring, folks, are the little veins that are running between the bones. Those are the collateral circulation I was talking about. Bovi, have it ready. What's bleeding are these little veins here running between the vertebrae. And I just have to sit here and paint them with electricity. Suck up the wall. Yep. Where else are you getting bleed? Where do you see it? Suck, please. Suck up here, show me. Don't suck the clocks off. Can you guys see okay, Sean? Yes, we can. All right, don't suck the clots. Go ahead and clean up that down there. Uh-huh, suck right here, right along where I'm working so I don't get too much jar, All right? There's always a lot of veins down here by T1 and T2. C7, T1, T1, T2. I'm sure there's more down below as well, but there's always a lot of circulation of blood down here, a lot of blood vessels. Show me. That's where you're gonna get most of your bleeding, by the way, if you're doing these types of surgeries as a surgeon. It's going to happen down at C7, T1, T1, T2. Again, staying on the bones. That's what the Bovi scratch pad is for, is getting rid of the char, okay? You want to minimize that, but sometimes suck, please. Suck the blood, yep. The char is really just blood, blood clot, sitting on top of your Bovi cooking. Suck, please. Suck, please. Now, there are very, very few surgeons that can do this surgery outpatient. We do these surgeries outpatient at Duke Spine. Most surgeons are going to take you to the hospital, which you don't want to be at the hospital, obviously. Everyone knows what's happening around the world with COVID-19. But the hospital is also a source of infections. Bacterial infections, not just viral infections. Because the truth is, the hospital doesn't want you to get infected. Irrigation. The, the problem is people who have infections go to the hospital. So the last place in the world this patient that I'm doing surgery on, or you if you're having neck back surgery, you don't want to be in the hospital unless you have an infection. So what we're seeing is these types of surgeries are migrating out of the hospital to a surgery center. But the problem is most surgeons can't do this surgery outpatient. We do at Duke Spine because of our technique. And that's what I'm trying to teach the world through these broadcasts. These are live broadcasts in case you're watching and wondering. None of this video is edited. If something bad happens, you're gonna see it firsthand. Many of my colleagues think that I'm crazy for broadcasting live spine surgery because they would never do it. 
because they're too afraid of someone seeing their screw-ups. But the reality is I feel pretty confident that if you do the surgery, if you know what you're doing, you can do the surgery properly without too many screw-ups at all, okay? And I believe in transparency and truth in medicine, and there's too little of that that exists already. So we broadcast these surgeries so that everyone can see what really happens, what's being said in the operating room, what's being done, you know. People screw up, you'll hear me complain. I have no problem complaining by even though we're being watched by a hundred thousand people doesn't matter to me I don't care whether they they're not here to judge me you know I'm here to educate them so if you're watching you're not doing me a favor I'm doing you a favor by teaching you what we do in the operating room which nobody else in the world will show you but we have the confidence at Duke Spine to be able to show you what we do because we want the world to see the right way to do these types of surgeries. There is a right way. And the reason it's the right way is because, number one, we're fixing the, the compression of the spinal cord and nerves, which a lot of surgeons are able to do. But we're doing it so that the patient is actually able to go home the same day. Now, that's not being done anywhere else. Suck here. So we want surgeons to learn how to do it properly so they can give the patients the same experience to be able to safely go home the same day. The other thing we do different is my patient's pain goes away after a few weeks and other surgeons don't. Their su patient's pain doesn't go away after a few weeks. Their pain stays there their whole life. I travel the whole world trying to solve that problem because in the very beginning, I've been doing this for 22 years, my patients that had this surgery, Dr. Patel might remember, they had horrible, horrible pain forever, for like years after the surgery. I traveled the world meeting with the best spine surgeons in the world saying, how do you keep your patients from having pain after this particular surgery, posterior cervical laminectomy fusion? They all laughed and said, it's impossible. Their patient's gonna have horrible pain the rest of their life from the surgery. And to me, that wasn't a satisfactory answer. So then I started to ask not surgeons, but therapists. And I said, why do these people have pain afterwards? They said, the muscles. The muscles scar, the muscles get uh, you know, pain from the inflammation in the muscle from the surgery and alignment, alignment. What does alignment mean? It means the curve of the spine. So these other surgeons are not putting the spine in proper alignment and they're not respecting the muscles properly. So I changed the way I did surgery changed my technique completely, revolutionized it, and doing so, I was able to keep people from having permanent pain in their neck after these surgeries. I don't know anyone else that's been able to do that. That's why I'm sharing this technique, because I want other surgeons to be able to give their patients the same experience around the world. And I know long after I'm dead and gone that these videos will be available for others to watch and learn from and study my technique. Remember, I'm right on the bone here. So now remember, I told you there are a lot of blood vessels in there between the spinous processes. There's one spinous process, there's another. So I always start by coagulating. It's a technique that I developed. It was not taught to me. I had to figure this one out. This is a Dr. Duke Majin technique for posterior cervical fusions. By bipolaring all these bag of veins, you can actually stop about half the bleeding that you normally would have in this surgery. And then, of course, I come through it with a bovi, which is a, AKA the hot knife. But by then, the, the veins are already, you know, 90% coagulated. Let me see, you're right in my way. Again, once you get on the bone itself, you don't have quite as much bleeding, but there's always an emissary vein, which comes right off the surface of the bone called the cortex. Dr. Patel, you want to add any information? There's a vein right there. I'm going to bipolar first. Your thoughts, Dr. Patel? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have patients with lots of pain with PCD before. Yeah, it's much, better now. much better now. And and part of that, by the way, folks, a lot of it is the surgical technique that I use. There's the other part is um, the therapy. Believe it or not, the physiotherapy is absolutely important. And not just getting any therapy, it's the type of therapy that's done. We use a company called Florida Sports and Spinal. We've been working with them for years. They've developed a technique after surgery of doing the therapy that keeps the patients from getting horrible pain. 
So it's not just my surgical technique, it's the whole treatment algorithm that we've developed collaboratively with other doctors, providers, chiropractors, as a matter of fact, to, um, to reduce patients' post-operative pain and make it go away. And it really has everything to do with how you treat the muscles. That's the secret. Okie dokie, our patient has very big shoulders, broad shoulders, he's a big gentleman, he's muscular, so I'm actually being pushed away from the wound a little bit more than normal. I'm having to lean over more to see. Um, and of course, that's affecting my, my back, making me more uncomfortable. Remember we talked about this earlier, about surgeon being comfortable during surgery is very important. Otherwise, they start thinking about their back pain, they get distracted, just like you do. Right? How easy is it to work or do things when your back is hurting? It's not, because you're constantly thinking about your pain. And what can I do to get rid of the pain? You're constantly doing things to avoid pain or, or alleviate pain. And those are behavioral changes that you really don't, that are disruptive to your normal life. That's really what it comes down to. So having, having to lean over, for example, so much for me is, dis is disruptive to the surgery because I have to keep stopping and straightening up to relieve the pressure on my back. I don't even have a back problem. But that's an example of somebody without a back problem that's creating a back problem through their biomechanics or body mechanics. Long story short, for people who live in chronic pain every day, they've got to make those adjustments to their life constantly to get out of pain. And that's what we do at Duke Spine is we fix pain so that people don't have to keep making those adjustments. All right. This is C2 once again. I'm confident. I don't feel a spinous process above. But what I'm not sure of is where is C3? So I have to make sure I'm at C3. Now, I believe this is C3 here. I believe this is C3, but I'm not 100% sure. But I have to be 100% sure as a surgeon. I can't be maybe that C3. So before I do my, my real bone work and start my major, really the major part of the surgery that I came here for, which is our, our decompression, and then our exploration of fusion, I gotta know where C3 is. So I think that's C3, I'm 95% I'm sure at this point because I don't see another lamina between C2 and C3. There's always veins here. It's a dangerous area because you got your brain stem right there. Not your brain stem as a surgeon, but the patient's brain stem, obviously. You got to get used to my my southern way of speaking, or maybe it's a west coast way of speaking. I don't know. Any more questions from our uh, um, watchers? Not currently. All right, so I'll talk a little more since you all love hearing me talk. So Duke Spine Institute has a Facebook group that you can go to join. We don't turn anyone away. And you can actually ask questions, get answers. And you can, uh, you can get answers from other people in the community or from the surgeons and doctors at Duke Spine Institute. It's called Spine Surgery Support Group. You don't have to be having spine surgery to use it. If you've got back pain, neck pain, or know somebody with back or neck pain, Ask to join and ask questions. We like answering questions. All right. So if that's three, this is four, five, six, seven, T1. So we need to go a little bit further south. What am I counting? I'm counting vertebrae. What does that mean? Well, vertebrae are bones. And most people know that all mammals have seven vertebrae in their neck. It doesn't matter if they're a giraffe or a, a dog or a cat. Everyone has seven, and humans do too. So I know everyone has seven vertebrae in their neck, and I use that fact to count to figure out where I'm at. Now, there's two ways to count your vertebrae in this type of surgery. One is to count from below going up, and the other is to count from the top going down, and I do both. See, we're not using a fluoro, we're not using an x-ray machine to confirm our levels. 
By not using an x-ray machine, I'm saving the patient from having radiation they don't need. By the way, radiation typically isn't good unless you're having treatment for uh, cancer. Even then, it's not good for the cancer, but it's also not good for your body. But sometimes it's the only treatment we have that, that may work against cancer. Some cancers are very sensitive to radiation. But radiation is also, suck please, is also used in medicine far more commonly for um, looking at bones and joints. You know, everyone knows what an x-ray is, right? So we use x-ray, which is radiation, electromagnetic radiation. We use x-rays to look at bones and joints, even the spine. We use x-rays when we do spine surgery quite often, but this is one spine surgery we can do without x-rays. And the reason is that we can count the bones. So once again, three, four, five, six, seven, T1, and now I need T2. So I need just a little bit more exposure, but I'm back to where all those veins are again. So I wanna get the bipolar, and I wanna preemptively coagulate those veins so they don't bleed so much. So far we've lost about, uh, I would say 15 mils of blood, 15 cc's, not very much. 15, we'll probably end up losing up to 50, somewhere like around maybe up to 50. Depends on how our anesthesiologist does with our blood pressure control. So far he's doing a, a marvelous job. I think the least I've ever lost on one of these types of surgeries is 15. I had one 15, mostly it's 30, 40, sometimes 50. I've sometimes had more than that. I've had 200, even 300 one time. But it's still far less than my colleagues that have uh, 500 to 1,000 when they do the surgery. A lot of surgeons don't like doing this surgery because they're afraid of the blood loss. They don't want that kind of blood loss. It's not something that anyone really wants, but it's inevitable because of the way they do the surgery. They can't avoid it. But there's things that I do that are different than they do that stop the blood loss and keep it minimal, such as the way I position these patients, which you guys can't see, unfortunately because it would give away the identity of the patient. So we're not allowed to do that. All these patients sign a release to let us broadcast, but they don't let us give their identity away. So um, we do everything we can to preserve their identity, unless they want to give their identity away, such as a testimonial or something afterwards. The point I'm making though is that there's things that I do that you can't see because they would compromise my ability to protect the patient's anonymity. And you're not seeing the patient, you're not seeing those positioning things because we don't want to let you see who the patient is. Does that make sense? But those positioning, the way I position the patient on the table is very important to pre preventing blood loss. Namely, I elevate the patient's head and neck high enough just above the level of the heart so that the bleeding doesn't, you know, there's not a lot of bleeding because there's not a lot of hydrostatic pressure basically. We're reducing the hydrostatic pressure in the blood vessels by elevating. Suck here. Uh huh. Good job. Nice. All right, we're getting very close to being done with the exposure. Probably another 10 minutes maximum. <coughs> There's C2, that's gotta be C3, C2, there's nothing in between them. So that's C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, T1, and then T2 is right here. I want a tiny bit more exposure on T2, tiny bit. I think I can get it without cutting the skin. Just a tiny bit. Just right there. That's where I'm going to put my screw. Now I need to do Dr. Patel's side. A little bit more, and then we'll be done with our exposure. 
Any questions? Not currently. So last week we did the same surgery. For those of you who watched, we had a 100,000 people reached on face. I think it was Facebook. And we had 32,000 views, which was a good amount of people from all over the world, by the way. We don't just broadcast in the United States. This is broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. And uh, again, the broadcast is free for anybody who wants to watch. We don't charge money. We're here to educate the public, other doctors, nurses, healthcare providers, chiropractors, anyone that wants to learn something about the spine. This is not a very common procedure. Most common is the anterior cervical discectomy infusion, which we do as well. We did one last week, if you watched. It's up here. This is a posterior cervical procedure. It's typically done by neurosurgeons, much less often by orthopedics, suck here. And I do these surgeries when patients have more than three levels that need to be treated in their neck with a fusion and decompression. Uh, if it's less than three, I go through the front because that's gonna be, I think, a better, faster recovery going through the front. But you do get swallowing problems when you go through the front albeit temporary. This is a more aggressive type surgery reserved for people who have more disease, in my opinion. And this patient has had, as I said before, their whole neck basically is affected, their whole spine. I didn't do their original surgery, somebody else did. I don't know how many, how many surgeries have they had on the front? Does anybody know, is this their have they had two? This is their third surgery. So. All right. So three, four, five, six, seven, T1. So we still have T2 to expose. I need a little bit more exposure down here. Knife. I'm going to give myself another five millimeters. Take. Suck, please. Remember, what's bleeding is not the skin, it's actually under the skin. It's called the subcutaneous tissues. So I'm very careful not to coagulate the skin, I go just below it. I know it looks like I'm not really paying much attention, but I am. It would be a big mistake to coagulate the skin with this hot knife. Again, it would never heal. You would guarantee an infection, basically, to the patient because that part of the skin would stay open and let bacteria in. So as a surgeon, don't ever, don't ever coagulate with a bovi the, the skin, or a bipolar for that matter. Bipolar is what I'm using now. Bi is two in Latin, pole means tips, two tips. And you can see it's called a bipolar. It actually sends the charge between the two tips. So it cooks whatever's between the two tips, whereas the bovi, the other instrument, cooks anything close to it and sends the charge through the body down to the patient's thigh or wherever you put their pad, their bovi pad. We put it on the thigh. During these surgeries, we do monitoring of the nerves and spinal cord. It's called intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring. We have, I believe, a neurologist. Is that correct? Suck, please. A neurologist who's monitoring all the wave waveforms, the electrical signals or waveforms, we call them. Electrical signals are converted to waveforms, digital waveforms, and they're monitoring all those waveforms during surgery. Let me see here. We are just about done. I need about two more minutes on the exposure. Suck here. A lot of juice. Right here. Lean forward and, and suck backwards towards you, yeah. There's the transverse process, T1. And then the transverse process of T2, right here. 
And our patient's going to have pain probably for about four weeks after the surgery is what I expect. As long as he gets the right therapy, the pain will go away just from the muscles. All right, not bad. Let him do some passing. All right. Yeah. So, Bowie. So, yeah, we've lost probably 15. Don't suck the quads off. All right. So, we got three, four, five, six, seven, T1, T2. Bobby, mm. stay off the clots, stay off the wall. Just suck the bleeding as it goes down. Just suck the blood here, suck here. Yeah, suck the runoff. All right, at this point, I've gone as wide as I want to. I go right to the end of the lateral mass and we've got the exposure we want. I'm looking at the fusion. I'm going to explore it. And that's going to be, that's C3-4. That's not fused. C4-5. Looks, looks pretty good. 5-6. Six, seven, obviously seven, one. All right. Let's go ahead and do our laminate. Are we bleeding again? No. All right, we've done our exposure. We're looking at the back of the cervical spine. The spinal cord is located inside there. Our goal right now is going to be to unpinch the nerves and spinal cord. The worst area is C3. We're going to do C3-4, yeah. and I'm debating if I should do the any other levels for the decompression. All right, so again, this is our osteotomy. We cut through the bone. There's C2. I'm sure that's C2. I can feel it. There's no C1 arch. I mean, no C1 spinous process, just an arch. Again, you want to cut in the right place. So this is the lateral mass. I can see that. So I want to cut right medial to the lateral mass. If you go further lateral than that, you're going to get into the lateral mass and compromise your screws, your fixation points. Plus, you can get into the arteries, the vertebral artery, become very messy. How's the view, Sean? It looks good. All right. A lot of uh, scar tissue right along the dura in the epidural space. This patient's had a lot of inflammation going on in their neck for a long time. I can tell by how much scar tissue there is. All right, now what's bleeding here is the diploic bone. I could leave it alone, but that's gonna bleed. So let me have bone wax on a stick. Let him do it. Bone wax on a stick, let's go. So I'm waxing the laminar edge, okay? And I'm gonna do that at C3 and C4 where I made my osteotomy. Let's see, suck here, see if it's bleeding still. 
That's epidural bleeding right there. The bone wax won't stop that. Uh, actually, I can wax this edge up here, which is bleeding a little bit, but then it would affect my bone graft, so I'm not going to do that. Okay. Here, I'm going to go to the other side. And I'm pretty sure that's it. There's no real significant stenosis at the other levels that were fused. I don't see any evidence of instability. The fusion looks good. I don't see any evidence of foraminal stenosis there. Let's see, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So my main focus for unpinching is going to be um, C3 and C4. That's where the decompression is needed. And then my focus for fusion is going to be from C3 down to T2. Suck for me, please. Again, there's a lot of inflammation. The, there's a lot of white scar tissue down there. Not used to seeing that much. Normally, right where the ligamentum flavum is, a lot of inflammation. Suck. So I'm done my osteotomy at C3. I'm working on C4 right now. Don't hit my butt on my drill. Yeah. You got nice bone though, you know? Nice bone. All right, well, let's see what I can do. What's that for? I need the scissor first. And now I need the Lexel. Have the coker available in case I need it. No. I probably need the coker. Take that, suck please. Let me see the drill. I may have to come back to your side, Dr. Patel. Let me just see if there's any attachment. Something's holding it in. It doesn't appear to be, could be this right here, yeah? Could be this, suck here, right here, right here. Yeah. Appears to have gotten that. Let me have bone wax on a stick. I'm going to wax this laminar edge. Good. That's good. Yeah, that one's not really bleeding. Let's come back to your side. So I've done my osteotomies at three and four. And... Um, I'm trying to remove the lamina and spinous processes of C3 and C4, but C3 is stuck still, so there's clearly still an attachment I need to release. I tried, you know, sometimes when you drill and you get it real thin, you can snap it. 
Of course. So I tried doing that with a coker, and I was unable to release this little bit of attachment of bone, meaning that there's more than just a little bit. So I've got to figure out where it's still significantly attached so I can release it. Obviously, this is the most, one of the most delicate steps, if not the most delicate step, because you're working at the C3 spinal cord, which is, um, where's the bipolar pedal things? Which is right where you don't want to be having any kind of an injury. So remember, the spinal cord is literally right where I'm working. I'm unpinching the spinal cord. That's my goal here, because it's being pinched, and damage is being done. And the goal of the surgery is to unpinch the spinal cord. I feel attachment here. Suck here. Let me have the sucker. I think that's where it's still attached, right there. That looks like the top of the lamina. That looks like the top. So what happens in this condition, folks, is that the bone will actually sublux. What that means is that this lamina up here will go underneath the C2 lamina as the spine collapses. Coker. So it gets really difficult to um, remove that piece of bone so I can free up the lamina because essentially There it is. There is a ligamentum flavum. And they're very short. Look how s short these spinous processes are. There's something wrong. Something happened. Compare them to the other ones. Look how tall this one is. It's about a third of the size. Well, there's the spinal cord. It's freed up. It's got a lot of scar tissue on the surface. That's why it's bleeding so much. You can see all that gooky stuff, irrigation. And then the dura's there, you can see that. But this webby stuff is some veins and scar tissue. All right, I'm happy with that. Let's go with the foramenotomy. Never, no pressure on the cord. Let me have a kerosene two. Let him do it, kerosene two. It's either a kerosene two or a kerosene three that I'll need. Just leave that. Let me have a three. Yeah, actually that did the trick. Let me have, sure, I'll take the three. Luis has always been a great teacher. Suck that. Mm -hmm. All right, that's good. Gel foam. Nice job. Don't just hand it. You got to put it in my hand the right way. No, if you're, yeah. You should always handle these things there and put it in my hand the right way. There you go. Okay? That's what you do. This is gel foam soaked in thrombin. The thrombin helps stop any venous bleeding, any bleeding at all from the veins, capillaries. Even in a small arterial, it can work too, but generally for little arteries, which have higher blood pressure in them, you have to uh, coagulate them or bovie them. Gel foam usually doesn't work long term. All right, Dura's covered. Drill. I'm going to start drilling our pilot holes. No, to put our screws in. What? Yeah, we're not, we're not doing, we don't need to decompress the rest because they're already fused. And on the MRI, there's not that much stenosis. So I think this is it. So our first will be a C3 lateral mass screw. I start not in the middle, but just inside and inferior, and I aim up and out 20 degrees, okay? If you do it and you do a 14 millimeter length of your drill bit, you won't injure anything. You go out and up so you avoid the artery and nerve. And then I'm gonna put one fixation point in the middle of the fusion, okay? And then I'm gonna put one at T1. And you want to aim away for the cord. 16 millimeter bit, 16 millimeter screw. Luis, let's go Sam, 16 millimeter. 
Hurry up, please. Sam, you need to get your hands moving. So here, here, here. That was a 16? Thanks. 14? Yeah, we're going to skip some because they're fused, okay? I'm not going to put a screw in every level. We don't need to. That's going to be counterproductive. I need two more 14s. And then I'm going to do one more 16 afterwards. Fourteen. Fourteen. Let's go, Sam. This is not hard stuff to do. Let me have a drill. Next will be sixteen, and then I'm going to go to the other side. Sixteen. How's our waveforms? Good. All right, so I got a screw at three, four, skip five, did six, skip seven, did T1 and T2. Okay? That's it. From I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. Please suck and show me. No, 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 no. Three, four, there's six, there's T1, and I'll do T2 since I'm here. And we need to do it anyway. Sixteen. Sixteen. Let's go. Good job. I'm going to use the second hole. Gel foam. Actually, bone wax. Sixteen. Now, sixteens always seem to bleed more, which is your T1 and T2 holes. Pedicle screws rather than lateral mass. What? No, I think it's that they're in the pedicle of T1. Yep. The other ones are lateral mass. They're not really pedicles. And lateral masses are affected by sclerosis, you know, bio forces, biomechanical forces. So you get a hyperplasia of the cortical bone or hyper hypertrophy of the cortical bone. The bone is a little softer at C4 and C3. All right, pretty much done here. We need 30 minutes, we'll be done. Doctor, doctor, anesthesia, we'll be done in 30 minutes. We should have everything bandaged on in 30 minutes or less. 25 to 30 minutes. Okay, 
So gel foam, as Dr. Patel said. Come on, needle holder. Needle holder. Let's get the rod temp. Move that out. Let's get the rod template. I need to align the screws so I can get the rod in. It's going to be a long rod. He has a long neck. So even though he's a tall pa patient, you know, his neck is longer than everyone else's, but he has the same number of vertebrae. So we still have only seven vertebrae in the neck in the cervical spine. Okay, Rod. Next is going to be the needle holder. Get it ready. Now, I have to create lordosis. I want the, the patient to have curvature. But at the same time, because they're fused across so many levels, I can't really um, create curvature in the fused areas. So I have, to, I have to have this rod nicely designed. No. My hand is like this. So you hold it like that. Get the rod cutter ready in case we need it. Actually, I don't think we will because the rod is cut perfectly. Question is, what's happening there? I need to bend it more. This bottom part looks good. I need to bend a little bit more there. We have a question. Yeah, I'll take the question. One of our viewers is wondering, the person getting this surgery, are they getting it because they weren't qualified for the laser endoscopic surgery? That is correct. The patient's getting this surgery because they couldn't, we couldn't do the laser surgery um, because they've had so many surgeries in the front of their neck. They have a lot of scar tissue. And to do the laser surgery, the Duke laser disc repair, we really need the tissues in the neck to be able to, to move. Like the uh, carotid artery has to move relative to the esophagus. And if I can't get them to spread apart, then I can't put a needle between them and I can't put my instrument between them. Why am I getting some spontaneous bleeding? How's our blood pressure? All right. So the fact this patient had multiple surgeries through the front of the neck made him not such a good candidate at all for the laser. You can have maybe one surgery through the front of your neck. Okay, look, the rod's in. I need set screws. He's right here. You see anything bleeding? Bovi? It's going to be right there, yeah. I won't do a laser surgery on a patient that puts the patient at significant risk of having a serious complication. So um, in over a thousand Duke laser disc repair endoscopic surgeries done on the neck and back, I've had zero complications to date. Nobody's been paralyzed, nobody's been killed, no vascular injuries, no blood vessel injuries, no hematomas, none of that stuff. And I want to keep it that way. Um, so if somebody is high risk for having a complication from a surgical technique that I'm using, I won't do that surgical technique. I'll, I'll find a safer surgical technique or I won't do the surgery if, it the, if the risks outweigh the benefits, in my opinion. Patients get to make those choices too. It came off. Pick up. Pick up. 
come on, Sam. Start, start getting used to the things, the tools, right? Oh, really? You want to be that way, huh? Try a sucker. That may work better. Here we go. So I'm trying to persuade the rod to the screw. In other words, I'm pulling the spine back just ever so slightly right here at C3 because I want to give this patient lordosis. I want to give them the proper curve. I'm not able to engage for some reason. I'm not sure why. It's unusual because there isn't that much that needs to be brought together so it's unusual that it's not engaging. I think this persuader is just not very good. Well, I think I might have finally gotten it. It's just, I don't know, is it an old one or something? Let me try again with the persuader. Big persuader? Yeah. I mean, I may have to go to the other one. So um, safety is really the main reason. We wouldn't do the Duke laser disc repair on this patient. I didn't ask for the other persuader. I said I may have to use the other persuader. I want the other one though. It becomes a safety issue. If it isn't safe, we don't do it. I've had to cancel the Duke laser disc repair once or twice because of safety issues. Whether the patient's blood pressure is too high. This set screw is not engaging. Let's try a different one. This one is, that one I think was defective. Okay. So let's make sure I don't get charged for it. <laughs> or the patient, I should say, doesn't get charged for it. All right, good. Some with the buttress threads at the end, I don't know. That's all right. I don't hold you accountable for each and every one, but your company just, you know, does do the right thing and Let's see the rod. Okay. Come on, let Sam do this stuff. He's got to get used to the movements. I think we're good on the rod length. I think it's perfect. I don't know that I need to cut it. Sam, what's next? Think. I have to bend the rod. What am I going to bend it with? That? Put it in my hand. It's okay. There's going to be a lot, but you've got to start forcing your brain to think. Anytime people have to do something new, they have to think through it. Luis is, so, is like your backup brain. But you got to be using your brain to, to solve these problems. Okay? Yep. Right, Dr. Patel? If you don't use it, you lose it. Yep. We have a question. Yes. One of our viewers is wondering, have you ever heard of Coflex implants and have you ever used them? Coflex. Yes, I've heard of Coflex. Coflex for sure. Uh, have I used it? Yes, I have. Uh, I'm not sure if there's another question there. I don't use it anymore. Um, I feel that that sometimes it's it's not appropriate to use depending on the patient's angulation of their spine. The Coflex device can actually cause, in my opinion, sometimes in some people, abnormal angulation that you don't want. So I'm not saying it's a bad device. It's just not for everybody. I don't know if I answered your question or not. But if you have a follow-up question, I'd be happy to answer it. I'm going to try to bend a little bit more. 
There are a lot of FDA approved things out there for the spine. I don't use them all. I don't use the ones that I don't feel are appropriate, are gonna give the patient the very best result for their problem. I typically use what I know works very well. So let's, let's make an analogy to fishing, okay? I'm learning how to fish these days. I'm a terrible fisherman. I know nothing about it, but I'm learning. And what I'm learning is that if you want to catch a specific type of fish, you have to use a specific type of bait, a specific type of year, in a specific location, at a specific depth. And you have to handle that bait the right way, otherwise you won't catch the fish. Surgery is not so different. The goal for surgery is to get rid of the patient's pain or nerve compression and to stabilize the spine and correct any deformity, right? We talked about that last surgery. So decompression, realignment, stabilization. Those are the three goals. Same thing with fishing. You might have some goals with fishing. To achieve those goals, you have to have the right equipment, the right technique. So there's lots of lures out there, lots of different kinds of bait, but if you're trying to have a specific fish or a specific result, you have to use just the right stuff. And I tend to use what I know works really well, okay? Um, I was watching a video on YouTube last night on how to catch sheephead. And this guy was describing in great detail exactly what you know, weights, where you want the weights, what weight you want, what hook you want, how big the hook is, how to place the hook, how to bait the hook. And surgery is the same way. If you want a great result, if you want to catch lots of sheephead, you have to do it exactly the right way. If you don't do it the right way, you're not going to have any luck. You're going to be like me. You're going to be sitting there for hours and get nothing accomplished. So there's lots of spine surgery being done in around the world that does not accomplish the goals. Right? You have lots of people having spine surgery, they still have pain, they still have nerve, nerve pain, nerve compression, neurological dysfunction. That's not how I want my patients to be. I want, for my patients, I want to catch the biggest, fattest, juiciest sheep head every single time for them. To do that, I have to have the right equipment, the right technique, the right location. Everything has to be perfect. Surgery, spine surgery is very similar to fishing. Beautiful. So the rods are perfect. The contour is perfect. I put some lordosis at the top so it pulls the spine back and gives him a nice curve. The surgeon that did his fusion actually did a good job, um, not just with getting the bones to fuse, but also with getting a nice curve back in that area that they fused. All right, final tightener. So I give that surgeon credit. A lot of surgeons don't pay attention to the angulation or curvature of the spine when they fuse. It's a big mistake and it creates problems for patients for many, many years of their life. So in having the right curve in the spine is like having the right bait when you go fishing. If you don't have the right bait, you're not gonna catch the right fish. If you don't have the right curvature, you're not gonna get the right result for your patient. The patient's gonna continue to have bad pain as a result of bad curvature that they're fused in. And that would be the rest of their life unless somebody comes along and uh, does osteotomies or corrects the curvature at other levels adjacent. But I think the biggest cause of adjacent segment disease in spinal fusions is bad curvature in the fused area that's being operated on. Surgeons don't pay enough attention to having the right curves. Everyone's thinking about decompression, 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 now stabilizations, decompression and stabilization. No one really talks about correction of deformity or alignment of the spine. And there's a few surgeons now that do around the world. They're good. They understand how important alignment is. It, all you have to do is have one or two patients that have bad alignment from your surgery and chronic pain the rest of their life. And it really pulls on your heartstrings and makes you think, God, I screwed that up big time. And if that happens, you never want it to happen again, especially if it's in your control. But you have to have empathy to really change as a surgeon to do better for your patients. Without empathy, you have no real drive to improve your technique. And I would say that the surgeons who are the greatest surgeons in the world in spine surgery, any surgery, have empathy. It's a key, key component to having a really good doctor. If your doctor doesn't have empathy, 
you won't have good, you won't have, in my opinion, such good results. All right. I'm being told that our waveforms are improved, right, yes, since sir. since before surgery. Yes, sir. So the uh, signals going through the spinal cord are actually better now. Yes, sir. SSEP, MEP, SSEP. SSEP. So we have improved spinal cord function now that we've done our decompression. We didn't make it worse by putting our screws in, which means my screws can't be in bad place. They're in a good place. We're going to irrigate the wound now with betadine developed at NASA, just around the corner from us. NASA is quite literally 15 minute drive from our front door. We are in NASA territory. Duke Spine Institute is located on the space coast of Florida. And I guess there's a, sh a launch this Wednesday, right? Everybody knows about that? Is this the first manned launch? So it's a big deal. Now, I was part of the shuttle program as a physician, a doctor, on the shuttle team. There were about three of us, each launch and landing, and our job was to save the astronauts in case there was a catastrophe. And so we were at the closest place a human being can be to a launch or landing. I was on the tarmac during the landings of the shuttle. And so, fortunately, we never had an incident, but um, it was one of the best experiences of my life serving NASA, serving the astronauts, serving my country. Drill. I just want the drill first. I don't want the cob. Get the cob ready. All right, now we're done with our instrumentation. I've realigned the spine, and I did that in two ways. Number one, the way I pinned his head. You can't see this, but his head is pinned in a Mayfield head tong with a skull. Literally pinned in a skull, and I pulled back to get good alignment. And then I also added the curvature I wanted in this particular part of the rod and the other areas to give us a good curve to the spine. Okay? So now we need to do our fusion. Oh, what are you doing? You're playing over there in the corner without me seeing what you're doing. What are you playing with, Dr. Patel? Mm -hmm. At this point, I'm going to be drilling the cortical bone off to promote fusion. Can you suck, please, Dr. Patel? Yep, perfect. I'll drill out the inner facet space right there, the uh, back of the lateral mass of four, five, six, seven, C1, and then of course T2. TP, lamina. Why am I doing this? You're all wondering. First time I saw this, I, I freaked out. Gel foam, suck that spot right there, just that spot. Gel foam. Good job. Let me have another pickup. Uh huh. And out. Oh, thank you. I freaked out because I didn't understand why my attending at the time at University of Florida in Gainesville, why Dr. Jacob was taking a drill to the patient's spine and destroying something so beautiful. And that's when I learned you cannot have a fusion without fracturing the bone. You must fracture. And what better way to fracture a bone in a thousand different places, drill, than, than a drill. Cobb. Every time this surface rotates as two flutes, it cuts through bone or mostly bone, hopefully not soft tissue. So we leave the bone graft there because that's good bone. We want to promote fusion. I don't take that auto graft away. I like to drill out the facets because the facets are a great place for uh, fusing. Gel foam. Now, when you get bleeding during the fusion part or the, um, you know, this part of the surgery where you're actually, de we call it decorticating, taking the cortex off and exposing the underlying diploic bone. When you get this, 
You really don't want to bone wax it. I need another pickup. Just grab two pickups when you do this, okay? So you're prepared, you're not wasting time. Uh-huh, good job. And gel foam, suck. Bone wax itself will actually stop fusion from happening. So I don't use bone wax back here when I get a little bit of bleeding during the decortication. I'll use gel foam and thrombin. Gel foam will reabsorb, dissolve, go away. Have that ready for the next time. Thrombin and gel foam are a safe way to stop bleeding. You don't have to go very deep. You just need to show the, the depoic bone. You all see that? Sean? Yes, we can. We want to expose the poic bone. And I like to drill out the joint surface, the facet joint. Transverse process. Okie doke. Suck here, please, Dr. Patel. I need bone graft now. Get rid of that blood, blood clot. I'm sorry, what did you say, Luis? Well, you should have um, allograft, right? I want it. Looking good, just ooze. And I like to focus my bone graft on areas that have the highest chance of failing to fuse. This area is fused, we know. We still call it a fusion today there because we're fusing across it. We call this onlay grafting because we're laying it on, onlay. Yeah, in a minute. All right, so we're done with our instrumentation. We tightened everything down. We're done with our decortication. We put our bone graft. So we've done our posterolateral fusion. Next is closing. Now to close, we're gonna do several things. We're gonna put a drain in. We're gonna inject the muscles. We're gonna put some antibiotic material at the bottom there, keeping our blood pressure very tightly regulated. Right, doctor? I'll do Expiral now. Expiral is a wonderful drug. It's non-narcotic, so it's not addicting. It's literally uh, just bupivacaine. Same thing the dentist puts in your teeth when they go drill a cavity out or gonna cause some pain in your mouth. They numb up the nerves at the back of the mouth. The sphenopalatine ganglion. They're gonna numb up the nerves back there so that you don't feel the pain. And that's what we're doing here. We're numbing up the muscle because what hurts after this kind of surgery? We already talked about it, muscle. Muscle hurts. Let's see what's bleeding here. Suck right there. I need a bovie. Ready? So once again, it's the muscle I'm most interested, weedy. Give me a second. Here's the muscle. I want to inject the muscle with this medicine that will give it pain relief for about 72 hours. Right, Dr. Patel? We did not invent it. This is actually available commercially in many places. And it's just expensive. So a lot of hospitals won't buy it. They won't provide it because it's too much money. That's one of the advantages of having our own center that I control, because I will spend the money to make the patients happy and get them better, safer, faster, keep them from suffering. But other, other places don't. Is there any risk to using this? Yeah, of course, it's, it's basically Novocaine. 
that gets around the nerves, it can actually stop them from working, right, Dr. Patel? How long, typically? It can be up to 72 hours. Yeah. So we're trying to be careful and inject it directly in the muscle and not get it anywhere else. And we use the manufacturer's recommended dose. No more, no less. Needle down. All right, now we'll take that. We may not need it. We do have to put a drain in though. So let's go ahead and do that. So put the drain in. Be careful. Don't do this. Just I'm gonna come off the incision about three inches, four inches. And you, you have to poke through the fascia Sometimes it bleeds, sometimes it doesn't. Then you use a long hemostat. Go underneath the fascia, right? The fascia's right there. Let me have a pickup with teeth. Remember, we're not using any more of those um, bayoneted pickups, okay? And you wanna come out in the muscle. Okay, if you come out above the fascia, that's not as good as coming out below the fascia. So there's the fascia right here where my fingertip is, we're below it. Okay, then you want to pull the drain end of the drain out. You want to kind of get an idea of how long of a drain you need. Okay. Drain's going to sit right in there and it's going to suck any blood or juices out for the first 24 hours. Cut between the holes. Nicely done, Dr. Patel. Get rid of the rest of that drain. This is a number seven JP drain. We lay it under the muscle, it's gonna suck the juices out because there's gonna be juices. We need our antibiotic, one gra oh, what is it, half a gram of ank? 500 milligram? Yes, sir. Yeah. Let me have a sucker. You guys gotta have the other sucker ready, okay? We're gonna need this till we are done with the staples. So you have it ready, you don't bury it, and hide it. Yeah, don't want too much blood clot in there. 500 milligrams, yep. take. Yep. Now vancomycin is really a great drug for this application. Yeah. Hmm? What, what, I couldn't hear you. P? Oh, PT? Yeah, go ahead. No, no, he's gonna leave. Thank you, Dr. Patel. What's he doing? You have two gloves, right? So as I said before, I've come full circle in my career to where in the very beginning, I used to close the wounds as a grunt in neurosurgery. Grunt means you're at the bottom. And for those of you who know what a grunt is. And I haven't been closing my own wounds for mm, 16 years. Plus it gives someone else a chance to do some of the interesting stuff. Somehow I didn't do this one right. Now it's good. So now at the end of my career, I'm back to closing wounds. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Generally the, the master or teacher doesn't close their own wound their student does. Dr. Patel is graciously helping me, assisting me, so he's, he is not really my student. Another spine surgeon learning from me would be my student. I don't have one at the time. So for the time being, I close my own wounds. And my assistant is not capable of doing it yet. And 
wound closure is very important. It's not something that can be done improperly. We talked about that at the beginning of the case. You don't want to sew your drain in. It's very bad if you do. Then you have to come back to the operating room tomorrow to take a drain out. So it would be really bad technique to do that. The patient would not be happy. So be careful not to sew your drain in. Yep. Obviously, when I'm talking about don't sew your drain and I'm talking to surgeons, hopefully none of you that are not surgeons are not considering doing these surgeries in your garage. There's the fascia right there, you see that? Nice job, Sam. You're rocking and rolling. I put these stitches about one every centimeter. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know what a centimeter is, think of it as a centimeter. Just pronounced funny. A centimeter is an old, an old language way of saying it. Uh huh? So you don't consider yourself at the pinnacle? As a what? At the pinnacle of your career. Am I at the pinnacle? Yeah, I, I know. I understand the question. I mean, from my skill level, I'm at the pinnacle of my career. My skills have never been better. Though my wound closing skills may have been better. <laughs> but my, you know, operative planning, performing the operation, knocking the bed remote control over with my thigh. Those are at their finest right now. But when I was closing these wounds for patients, you know, three, four surgeries a day in residency, I was a lot better. Oh, I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, there's nobody in the world that does the surgery, I, I think, as well as we do. And what I mean by well, I mean the minimal amount of blood loss, the fast recovery. This patient will be going home and, I mean, we'll be done here in 10 minutes, 15 minutes max. They'll spend two hours in recovery and go home. Yeah. So, yeah. And then avoiding complications. I don't think anyone has a better rate record than I do because since I've had zero. So you can't beat zero and I don't think there's too many surgeons with zero. I would say out of the probably, maybe there's 3,000 in the United States that do this type of surgery. I would say five at most have zero complications. So, and then we do it pretty expeditiously, oh, yeah. right? So you don't want patients under anesthesia for too long. And our surgeries are, are faster than anyone else I know. So from an efficiency, safety, and then effectiveness standpoint, I don't think there's any better. Yeah. From a recovery standpoint, same thing. Scissor. That's how I judge surgeons, is their outcomes. And that's how surgeons should be judged, is their outcomes. Not where they work. Not, um, you know, who they work with. Not if they have a robot. Right? They should be judged on their outcomes, you know? 
One, oh, it's here, Adson. Adson is only for the staples, okay? okay. All right, so now I gotta bring this skin together and I wanna look at my lines that I made and make sure they line up. I like to start in the middle. So I go to the hatch mark that's closest to the middle. And I go in in the dermis, just about mid dermis. And I come out in the fatty tissue below the dermis. And you want to get it snug as a bug. And then I'll start on either end. For this patient, we'll start up at the top, up by their skull. And again, come out at the hatch mark, which is the ink line that I used before surgery. I used a marking pen. Go in at the hatch mark, mid dermis, come out in the fat. And you, where you go in and come out on both sides has to be the same. If it isn't, if you get more tissue grabbed on one side than the other, guess what's gonna happen? Then one side is gonna be higher up. It's not going to look right. And it may not heal properly if it doesn't look right. And as a surgeon, believe it or not, patients a lot of times will, will judge you based on your incision and what it looks like after surgery. I you guys always should have something here for me to wipe with, okay? What do you think that is? A ray type. No, a ray type. A lap would be okay, but a ray type would be better. Any questions? None currently. All right. So for those of you watching, we call this closure, closure, as opposed to what we did earlier, which was exposure. In the very beginning, we did an exposure. We exposed the spine so we could operate on it. And now we're doing closure, where we're closing everything. And for this type of surgery, there's three layers. There's the fascia, which we already closed. I showed you guys. There's the uh, subcutaneous tissues and epidermis, or sorry, dermis, which we're doing now, which is very important. And then there's the skin, with which we use staples. And that's, of course, important as well. But by the time you get to the skin with the staples, everything has already come together, and it should look just about done before you even put the staples in. The edges of the skin should line up nicely. Now, I like an interrupted suture like I'm using. This way, if you cut one accidentally and screw up, then um, it doesn't unravel the entire suture. If you use a running suture for this layer, then you're putting yourself at risk of having to start all over again. I would not recommend a running suture for the back of the neck. This is very thick skin. It takes a long time to heal. You don't want to screw around. Use interrupted sutures like I'm doing. I think that's the best way to do it. You can see some suture from the other layer deep in there. That was the fascial layer. See how beefy red everything is? Can you guys see that? That means there's good blood flow, perfusion, I should say. If that's the right word. There's good perfusion. This patient's tissues are well perfused. You would see that in their SpO2 readings, right? On a pulse ox. We have a question. Sure. One of our viewers is wondering, how do you not get sick to your stomach looking at open wounds for so long? Hmm, that's a great question. Well, I don't know if you heard my story a few weeks ago, but when, uh, when I was just a medical student, just starting, coming out of college, I hadn't seen any open wounds, really, except for my own. 
playing soccer or stubbing my toe on the asphalt, running around as a kid without shoes. So um, the very first night I was in medical school, before school even started, my roommate, who was a complete and utter nerd, he ended up going to neurosurgery as well. He told me, hey, let's go to the hospital and watch surgery. So I said, how can you do that? You know, it's like, I think it was Saturday night in Los Angeles, downtown LA, southeast LA, where all the gangbangers are. We were at County Hospital, Los Angeles, USC Med School. And he said, let's just go over there. I bet you we can get in. So we literally walked over to the hospital, which we were staying in the nurses' dorms for med school across the street, walked over to the hospital, walked through the door, upstairs to the operating rooms, and went and put scrubs on and walked in to the orthopedic OR where they were doing surgery in the middle of the night. I think it was like 9, 10 o'clock at night at the time. And they were hacking away at a shoulder, trying to fix it. And blood started squirting everywhere. I got very lightheaded, sick to my stomach. And I got dizzy and I almost, I mean, I literally went down like a sack of potatoes. My friend was laughing at me the whole time, saying, you wanna be a surgeon? So that was the only time I ever got sick. I mean, other than that, I don't know. I just don't think about it. And even if I do think about it, it doesn't bother me. I mean, most surgeons develop so just kind of a, a tolerance, I suppose, for, uh, for it, where it doesn't really bother us. Yeah, you gotta tell me how many I've left. I only need I only need two more. So I think we're good. Unless I unless I break one. I don't know what to tell you. I can tell you one thing, I'm very hungry. <laughs> if I had a cheeseburger in my left hand, I'd be eating it right now. Um, but it doesn't bother me one bit. I don't know. It's weird. I agree. I can't explain it. I don't have an answer for you, to be honest. I don't know if anybody does. I guess, I don't know. I just know I'm doing good for somebody and it doesn't bother me that I'm cutting them and sewing them. Scissor, all right. <clears throat> so my back is starting to hurt. So the way I do this layer of suture is very important. You can't have a long tail, otherwise it sticks out of the wound. So I literally go into the wound with the tips and I snip it, okay? The person that taught me how important wound closure was, was Dr. Roten. And he did it, he did it, he's a genius. He was the chairman at UF in Gainesville, my chairman, world famous neurosurgeon. He taught me <laughs> in the strangest of ways, and maybe I'm just strange, but he taught me how important wound closure was because he wouldn't let anyone close his wounds, not even a senior or chief level resident, seventh year neurosurgery resident. Closing a wound is something you learn in your first year. But he wanted to close it himself. And by doing that, he said to me with a very bold statement, wound closure is very important. So I, the chairman of the department, the most senior neurosurgeon here, world famous, I have lots of other things I could be doing with my time, but I'm gonna close my patient's wound. Did I do the same? No, because I had really good help for years. I had great physician assistants who I trusted, and they did a great job with wound closure. But that's who taught me how important the wound closure is. Let me have a Adson. Dr. Roten did. You can do the most perfect surgery in the world, ten, spend 10 hours of operating and take out the worst tumor ever been taken out of somebody in their brain or spine. And if you screw up the wound closure, you've killed that person, basically. They're gonna have infection and all kinds of complications, and it's gonna be your fault because you didn't do the wound closure properly. So. I, uh, I know it's very important, part of surgery, to finish it properly. It's kind of like running a marathon. If you, you're the fastest one out there until the end, but the last 100 meters, someone comes from behind you and beats you you're, because you didn't finish properly. It's just like having a bad finish in surgery. If you don't close the wound, you didn't have a good finish in running. 
and you can get beaten. So I have one last layer to do, and that's staples. We're going to do that next. We're going to also sew the drain in. All right, let's go ahead and do the wet dry then first. Well, I mean, uh, let's do the drain. Let's do the drain first. Let's do the drain first, since you have the suture in your hand. All right. Drain stitches are fairly easy. It's okay if you get the drain. It's not as important. The important thing is to come from bottom to top. Go to the other side. How was your view, by the way, in first person? John, did it? Did the camera hold position throughout the surgery well, or did it shift? It looked good for most of the surgery. It's not good now. I'm using the eye in the sky right now. Is there a problem with the first person? No, the eye in the sky just offers a better vantage point on the stitching. Got it. That's fine. How are we doing, folks? I'm literally going to be done in five minutes. Uh, Anesthesia. Yes, sir. Five minutes. Less than five minutes, whatever. I'm going to just do the staples next after I finish this drain stitch. Scissor. Wet dry. I wet. Look how perfect that incision looks, folks. That's the way it should look, okay? The skin edges are coming together on their own. They don't need me to even put staples in, but we don't want anything creeping in there while this patient's rolling around in bed, recovering at home. And you don't even really need to evert the edges because they're already everted. There's no dog ears. Dr. Patel snuck out on me. How's our blood pressure? How's our blood pressure? Doctor? So it's good. Let's keep it there, not any higher. I don't let my patients lay on their incisions. I want this incision up in the air. All right, at this point, we're going to put some polysporin on the uh, incision. Oh, damn it. Get rid of this shit here, okay? Scissor. Excuse me, you're moving your hand. There should be a bead of polysporin. This is not a, uh, a wedding cake with royal fondant. There should be a nice thick bead of antibiotic cream. Don't get, don't give me a pavé. Oh well, we'll just use that. All right, at this point, I'm gonna want those scissors back clean, so get your wet dry and wipe the tips while you're waiting for me. I still need these four by fours, rolled in thirds. Okay, that's your job. Where's the other four by four rolled in thirds? That's in half. All right, that's in third, good. All right, now I want the lap. Not the wet dry. You use the wet dry to clean my scissors. Okay. Do it now. I do the same thing every single surgery. Release, release, anesthesia, release. Okay, I don't change what I do ever. So you have to learn my sequence and you have to accommodate me. That's your job. You understand, Sam? All right, once we get here, I move this here and leave it there. I take this off, and now I'm ready for my tape, my paper tape and scissor. You want to use Millipore? 
I might be able to use Millipore. But with Millipore, I don't need scissor. They want me to use Millipore, which I'm not opposed to. It breathes better. Oh, you want my autograph? How come we didn't have any music this whole case? Blank checks. Where? 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 Are you trying? What are you trying to do? Trying to get my attention? What is that? It? Trying to get my attention? I don't. I don't respond to blank checks, especially if they're mine. I'm not going to be happy about that. If you want to get my attention, there's one way to get my attention, for sure. Don't do your job properly. That will get my attention. I guarantee it. I'm like a troll when it comes to people not doing what they're supposed to do. I don't let it go. Beautiful. Beautiful, 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 perfect. I'm happy. Our incision is closed. Now we have one more task, and that's to get our patient safely disconnected off me, safely off the bed, and onto the gurney. Somebody should be helping me with my gear right now. Somebody should be moving over to help me. All right, we're going to come over there and answer some questions in a minute.
Okay, Dr. Dugmajan here wrapping up a posterior cervical laminectomy infusion. And we were just chatting for a second about views. And last week we had 100,000 people that were reached with our broadcast that was live. These are people all over the world. I think it was a Thursday surgery, was it? Was it the Thursday surgery that was 100,000, Sean? And then this week is Tuesday. So maybe Thursday is a better day for viewing. Who knows? Um, our surgery went well. For those of you who watched, every one of these surgeries is different in one way or another. Um, some patients have had prior surgery on their neck, on their spine. This patient had had fusions done before through the front of their neck. And I felt there were very high risk going through the front to have a complication by injuring a blood vessel or the esophagus or pharynx larynx, carotid artery, jugular vein, et cetera, anza cervicalis, maybe even uh, vagus nerve. So we wanted to avoid injuring any of those structures that could be compromised from the prior surgery. And I wanted to go through a safe path to get to the spine and fix it. So we went through the back of this patient's neck. And by going through the back, we created a safe path through the back. The, the only problem with going through the back is the patients have more pain after surgery from their muscles than going through the front. And this patient will have sore muscles for several weeks, but we will take our strategy and our precautions that we've implemented over the years for patients that have this kind of surgery to reduce the amount of pain that the patient has in their neck after surgery from surgery. The pain always comes from the muscles and the incision. The incision will be healed in less than a week. The muscles take usually a month or two to heal. It's imperative that patients have proper therapy with the right exercises, the right number of repetitions, the right number of amount of weight, the right range of motion, the right specific um, exercises that they'll be doing in the gym with weights, whether we're talking about muscles, muscle development of the trapezius, reconditioning the trapezius muscles, paraspinous muscles. They all need different treatment based on the type of muscle and how long the patient's been having problems with their neck because muscles, different muscles decondition at different rates in different patients. So the basic problem is deconditioned muscles. The solution is therapy, but it's the right type of therapy done in the right way for the right amount of time. And that's really the magic juice is in the therapy rehabilitative side is the therapy has to be done properly. If it's not, patients will have chronic neck pain. Their muscles will be sore and tender and spasming the rest of their life after this type of surgery. So fortunately, we've partnered with Florida Sports and Spinal here at Duke Spine Institute, and we refer our patients to them. They end up doing wonderful therapy, and the patients heal very quickly. Now, for those of you wondering, are we in a hospital? We're not. We're actually in a surgery center. This is an outpatient surgery being done that you watch today. This patient's going to go home in two hours. They're going to have soreness in their neck. That's normal. Um, but it's going to take them a few weeks of recovery at home and they'll, they'll feel really, really good is what I expect. Uh, we didn't have any complications during surgery. The old fusion from before appeared to be solid, so I didn't need to do any additional work at those levels, so that's saving the patient from having anything done unnecessarily, like a laminectomy for amenotomy in those areas. We did have to fuse across those areas. Um, well, like I said, everything went really well. I didn't have any complications, and I think our patient's gonna do very well as long as they get a good recovery with good therapy. Um, their problem with their spine should be fixed once and for all. And uh, yep, this patient should go home soon. And then maybe we'll have a testimonial for you in a few days. The drain that we put in will be removed tomorrow when they come into clinic and be seen and checked. They will be taking pain medication. It's not possible to avoid taking narcotic painkillers or opioid painkillers for this type of surgery. These patients need to take it for about two weeks to anywhere between two weeks to two months. With an average of about six weeks after surgery, they'll be taking painkillers for their pain. Um, and that's with the very best results with this type of surgery. So for surgeons that have patients that have pain longer than that, they end up on painkillers for six months to a year or even longer because of the pain from the surgery, that's residual pain from the surgery. So having the surgery done properly is very important and to have a great decompression result, unpinching the spinal cord and nerves, but also 
to have a great result with respect to the soft tissues like the muscles healing properly and not causing chronic lumbosic chronic cerv cervical strain or sprain which causes muscle spasms that last for months if not years all right i think i've said enough i don't think we have any additional questions enjoy your day we do have a duke laser disc repair coming up next in a very unusual spot t11 t12 i've i've made no promises to the patient they understand that i'm going to do my best to reach this herniation but it's in a an area of the spine that's very difficult to get to and we may end up having to abort if i don't